Hello, guys. Good morning. Um, this is May the 5th. It is a Tuesday. It is raining a lot, and it is still rather cold. Um, perfect May weather, right? All right, let's uh, begin before we go into uh, the age of science and reason that I hope to finish today. Let's talk about... Uh, several things. Number one, a, a number of you guys um, ask about your, uh, com I mean, comments, trust me, uh, over the weekend, I graded all the DBQs and I wrote comments, uh, even just how the, the points broke down on your uh, DBQs. Um, I wrote comments for everyone's. And a number of you saying, well, Mr. Wharton, I can't find those comments. Where are they? And here's what happened. Uh, first of all, please know that Canvas is still, Canvas is something that you, as you might remember, in the third, as late as the third quarter, as late as March 16th, I'd never touched before, really. Never utilized it before. And now it is my primary conduit for reaching you. And so I'm still learning about it. It's like, once again, um, I'm flying the airplane while I'm still building it. And so here's what happened. So, you know, I went through all 70, whatever, of the, uh, DBQs. Some people, very few, but some people neglected to do them. And, you know, I mean, by this time in the game, guys. But anyway, some people, uh, I went through all of them and, um, wrote comments for all of them. And then, you know, um, about, well, about 40, uh, 36 hours later, uh, a student or two had asked me, will you open, I did, I, you know, uh, whatever they said happened. And uh, could you open up the portal for me again? Here's what I didn't know that when I open the portal again, that um, all those comments that I had written for you all, they all disappeared. Yeah, fancy that. All those comments I spent all that time working on, now were, what does Kansas say? Dust in the wind. And that was disappointing. I mean, it really was. Uh, I hope you got to look at your comments. I am sorry. Uh, I tried to be a nice guy. Hmm, go figure. Uh, okay, secondly, your e-ticket. I told you that you were to get your e-ticket for the exam yesterday. Obviously, that's not true. Uh, hopefully, word to the wise, all the materials from the college board, read through them yourself. Now, if you did not receive anything from the college board yesterday and you still think you're taking your exam, it is time to panic uh, because that, that is how the college board is going to communicate with you. That is how the college board is going to send you the test on May the 13th. And so if you didn't receive anything yesterday, it is time to panic and start making noise. Although at this day and time, if uh, you're not registered for the exam, I'm not sure what can be done for you. Uh, I mean, and it really is out of my hands. I don't have anything to do with the administration of the exam. But anyway, <clears throat> And so the e-ticket, no, you didn't get that yesterday. You got a bunch of information. You got a uh, sample that you, it, you basically showed you how to sign on for the exam so you'd be comfortable with doing it when it counts for a grade. Do that. Practice that, you know. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Um, your e-ticket, though, will come Monday on May the 11th. And then, once again, your test is on May the uh, 
13th, you sign on at 3.30 and you take the exam at 4. Please go through the procedure for signing on that they sent you yesterday. Uh, I've gotten messages back from a number of students saying they're comfortable with the procedure. That makes me feel very good. I want more of you to do that. Uh, you know, so we can all go into this. Um, oh, yes. Now, I sent you a rather long thing on Canvas this morning. I'm not using email anymore, guys. Uh, it seems that uh, when I would send out mass emailings to you the last couple of times, I was getting them all back. And so, therefore, I go through Canvas and, you know. But anyway, I sent you a long message in the assignments on Canvas, very long it's over a thousand words. I'm sorry. Read the whole thing. Uh, part of it's a message from me. Uh, now, the second part is just important. It's an email from Miss Coleman. Uh, it seems that certain people who take the exams, and I don't know if this is you, need to be able to print out forms for some purpose. I don't know why. Um, but if that applies to you and you don't have a workable printer, then Miss Coleman is going to hand out those forms Thursday afternoon from 4.15 to 5.15 outside of Ryle. Um, yeah. And so look through that. Uh, and if you have questions... To be real honest, once again, as far as the administration of the exam goes, I don't have a lot to do with it. Uh, uh, please contact Ms. Coleman at the guidance office uh, at school. Um, so, uh, okay, other things. Well, I think that's it as far as the extracurricular things. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I'll be commenting on them later. Remember, you do have your last review test uh, that I haven't quite finished yet, but it comes on uh, Friday. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of material to cover. Will we finish it? I don't know. Let's begin. Hopefully you pulled up your study guide, The Age of Science and Reasoning, which, by the way, you do know that I didn't go. Remember, I didn't go over this in the second quarter. And so this is not a bad thing for us to be doing. Uh, this is your collaborative test that you took home and worked with each other. Well, now we're going to go over it. Uh, so, Frederick, now we're on Roman rule 19, by the way, in Age of Science and Reasoning, the Enlightenment. Frederick the Great of Prussia made many changes in Prussia that could be termed progressive. Frederick the Great liked to be and probably was considered an enlightened despot, a smart king, a king who embraced, or at least for appearances, embraced, seemed to embrace the, the, uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment. Fre Frederick the Great uh, made many changes in Prussia that could be termed as progressive. He brought in workers from outside of Prussia to do things uh, uh, that Prussians were less adept with. He directed new attention to Prussian agriculture. Swamps in, in Prussia were drained, and he introduced new crops, um, the potato and the turnip, particularly the potato. I mean, um, if you've ever tasted German cuisine, which is really heavy, um, starchy, but the potato is a central piece of German cuisine. Uh, for those of you who take German, you'd know that. Uh, and the turnip. Uh, he also established a land credit association to help landowners raise money for agricultural improvements. Most people, though, did not prosper under Frederick the Great's rule. The tax burden fell most heavily on the peasants and the townspeople. However, he was religiously tolerant. He allowed Catholics and Jews to settle in his predominantly Lutheran country, which will be something that later on Otto von Bismarck will do away with. Uh, 
but always appointed Protestants to positions of authority in the army and the government. <coughs> he also ordered the codification of Prussian law. Uh, he referred to himself as the first servant of the state, but between me and you, Frederick the Great was nobody's servant. The government became more bureaucratic and less personal under, uh, under his rule. You know, a bureaucracy is just a ginormous way of handling red tape. You know, there are various levels. For example, and I don't want to go too far into this, but, you know, our school is a bureaucracy. Uh, you have you, students, and then you have me, teachers, but, you know, then you have principals, then you have various departments, and, and then really the school is a simple bureaucracy. Governments, in fact, the United States government is the largest bureaucracy in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Roman number 20. The most enlightened of the enlightened despot was Joseph II of Austria, son of Maria Theresa. Uh, Joseph II, if you ever watched, uh, and you probably didn't, shame, if you ever watched the film Amadeus, Joseph II ruled Austria when Mozart was alive. And Joseph II, uh, who one of his nicknames was the musical king, because he liked to not only play music, but he liked to perform and learn music. He fancied himself a truly enlightened despot. He actually, of all the enlightened despots, I mean, the guy took the ideas of the enlightenment to heart. Uh, slept on straw, ate nothing but beef. He sincerely wished to improve the lot improve the lifestyle, the conditions of his people. He was well-intentioned, but rather naive, and the result of his rule was a series of aristocratic and peasant rebellions that crossed the Habsburg Empire. Machiavelli would be the first one to say that you can be too nice. Austria, as you know, the Austrian Empire was diverse, had lots and lots of different ethnicities in it, uh, Maria Theresa had practically guaranteed the Hungarians during uh, during her reign that she was going to give them some sort of self-rule, and they held on to that promise. Maria Theresa then had to solidify the rule of the state outside of Hungary. Maria Theresa had tried to help the peasantry by limiting the robot. Robot, that's another word. It's called the corvée in France. And it's called the robot. It's called the robot in Austria. And they both mean the same thing. And the robot in the corvée was a tax paid to the government through labor, not through money. Um, but Maria Theresa's concern was not humanitarian, but once again trying to improve the pool of potential recruits for the Austrian military. Joseph II was more, had more wide-ranging reforms uh, than his mother. He wanted to increase the size of the empire. Uh, he tried to answer the pluralism of the empire's diverse peoples by centralizing government control. He also tried to reduce Hungarian autonomy, which was something that Maria Theresa had already opened uh, that box, and so it was very difficult to close it. And he refused to have himself crowned King of Hungary and required the use of German in all governmental matters for streamlining, which, of course, caused resistance. The Huns, Magyars, Hungarians resisted, and by 1790, Joseph had to rescind most of his measures. Joseph II, as, yes, same guy, tried to answer the religious dogmatism of his mother with tolerance. He said, what does that mean? His mother said Catholicism, Catholicism, and that's it. Now, Maria Theresa had been an advocate of Catholicism and an opponent of toleration. Joseph, although he's a practicing Catholic, favored a policy of religious toleration. He also saw religious toleration as a way of reducing the strength of the Roman Catholic Church and influence in the Austrian Empire. 
Uh, he extended freedom of worship to Lutherans, Calvinists, and the Greek Orthodox from 1781-1789. He also issued a series of edicts uh, that relieved Jews in his empire of certain taxes and also signs of personal degradation, such as the wearing of the star, the yellow star. Uh, he also extended to Jews the right of private worship. Jews, however, were not granted the full rights of equity as other Habsburg subjects, but it wasn't improved. He also attempted to bring some of the institutions of the Roman Catholic Church under his direct control, which was taken on a giant. He forbade direct communication between Austrian bishops and the Pope in Rome. He dissolved more than 600 monasteries and confiscated uh, Catholic Church lands in the Roman Empire, or, sorry, in the Austrian Empire. Uh, he dissolved the tra traditional. He dissolved the traditional Roman Catholic seminaries, which instill loyalty to the Pope and too little concerns for their future parishioners. In effect, Joseph's policies made priests the employees of the state, ending the influence of the Roman Catholic Church as an independent institution of Habsburg land. Habsburg land. You see, he made priests the employees of the Roman Catholic Church. The ecclesiastical policies of Joseph II were known as Josephinism and predated those of the French Revolution. In other words, these policies of religious toleration that Joseph came up with actually comes before the French Revolution. Joseph sought to improve economic life of his domains. Um, he also reconstructed the judicial system to make laws more uniform and rational and to lessen the influence of local landlords. Uh, Joseph uh, introduced a system of reforms that touched the very heart of the social structure of the rural countryside. He did not try to abolish the authority of the landlords over the peasants, but he <clears throat> did seek to make that authority more moderate, moderate and subject to the oversight of the crown. He, Joseph, abolished serfdom as a legally sanctioned condition of servitude. Now, he abolished serfdom. That meant these guys became peasants. And as peasants, they could leave the manor uh, and also but they also had to pay rents. Serfs do not pay rent. Serfs are property. Peasants do have to pay rent. He granted the right to marry, to, uh, to engage in skilled work, and to have children engage in skilled work without the Lord's permission. See, those were, you know, actually pretty liberal things. For what it's worth, all these Josephinism, all these Josephine reforms, when he dies, they're pretty much all going to be rescinded by his brother, Leopold. So um, he also tried to try to make land ownership and leasing property to, to serfs easier. Near the end of his reign, he proposed that any and all who own land would be taxed regar regardless of their social status. He abolished the robot. Remember the robot? Tax and labor. And commuted it. He changed it into a monetary tax, only part of which was to go to the landlord. The rest went to the state, and of course the landlord was like, uh, Some nobles resisted this edict. It was never enforced after the death of Joseph II, caused great turmoil. As peasants, you know, they it's hard to give somebody a little taste of freedom because inevitably they want more. And that's what happened here. Uh, it caused great turmoil as peasants revolted over the interpretation of the new rights. Hungarians resisted Joseph's centralization measures and forced him to rescind them. Joseph never understood the importance of cons consolidating political constituencies. And you're saying, what does that mean, Mr. Horton? It means that even if you're a monarch, you need support. You need people in power who, yes, they're beneath you, but you need their support to get anything done. 
Uh, what did Abraham Lincoln say? Without, uh, with public opinion, nothing is impossible. Without uh, public opinion, nothing can be done. Yeah, same thing. Uh, so, Joseph II never understood that. He just thought, I'm an absolute monarch. I can make all these changes. And well-intentioned, but anyway, part M. On Joseph's death, the crown went to his brother Leopold II. Leopold was coerced into repealing the most controversial decrees, such as that on taxation. On other issues, Leopold disagreed with his brother, such as returning the local authority to the nobility to ensure them a voice in government. Leopold kept Joseph's policies on religion and tried to keep the government centralized as much as possible. Okay, that takes us to Roman 21, Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great of Russia understood very well the need for a base of support. Um, Catherine the Great, we could talk about her a lot. Most people who are quasi-authorities of Catherine the Great know that Catherine the Great uh, had her husband, Peter III, murdered. And uh, she, uh, most people, what most people think about Catherine Great, the only thing I think about her is she had a voracious sexual appetite, which she had lots of sexual partners in her life. And she actually would pay them for as long as she was using them. And then when she was finished with them, she uh, gave them some title or pension or. One of them, she even made the king of Russian Poland. Anyway, Catherine the Great of Russia. Uh, so, Roman Rule 21, Part A. Peter the Great, we've talked about, uh, was succeeded by his wife, Catherine the I, and then by his grandson, Peter the II, who died. And then in 1730, the crown went to Anna, a niece of Peter the Great. Uh, later, Ivan VI, and for, for two years, became the Tsar. Later that year, Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth came to the throne until 1762, but she was a mess, her court was a mess, and by 1762, much of the power of the Tsar that Peter the Great had amassed, control of his own government, had vanished. And then in 1762, Peter the Third came to the throne. Uh, Peter the Third uh, was a bumbling fool. I mean, there was something wrong with the guy. Uh, he liked to dress up in uniform, and he liked to act like he was commanding soldiers. He liked to spank people, including his new wife, Catherine, who couldn't stand him. Uh, and um, in fact, he considered himself a military man, but that was the last thing he was. Uh, what eventually will get him killed is that uh, during the uh, during the uh, the war of let's see, uh, it was the uh, Seven Years War. Correct. It was during the Seven Years War. I think I'm right on. Um, Peter the Third, his armies had pushed into Germany uh, all the way to the city of Berlin, and Berlin was within their grasp. Frederick the Great uh, was within the grasp of the Russian army. But here's the thing. Peter the Third loved Frederick the Great. He idolized the guy. He wanted to be just like him. And so he said, well, you know, and you got to remember this, the Russian army had lost men, suffered, and now they're about to seize victory. And Peter III said, um, I don't know, let, let's just quit. Let's, let's stop. And the commander of the Russian armies, a guy named Gregory Orlov, and a bunch of his other generals um, surrounded Peter III in a remote tent and uh, beat him to death. Probably, probably, almost surely likely, with the uh, cooperation of Peter III's wife, young Catherine, Catherine the Great. And that made Catherine the Great 
who, you know, the monarch, because Catherine already had uh, a, a son through Peter the Great. Uh, it was said that was the only time she had uh, consummated uh, the marriage with him, to was to produce this son, Paul. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So for 20 years, Catherine, uh, for the first 20 years, from 1745 to 1765, Catherine lived in misery and also danger of assassination because her mother-in-law didn't like her. She was not loyal to her husband as monarch or husband. Peter, once again, was deposed and murdered, and she was immediately declared empress. Catherine knew through her readings in the Enlightenment that Russia was a backwards nation of Europe, the most backwards um, nation of Europe. Catherine also knew she needed a broad base seat of support to gain the authority she desired. So in 16, 1767, she summoned a legislative commission to advise her on revisions of the law and government in Russia. 500 delegates came from all over Russia and Russian life. And in 1768, Catherine then dismissed the commission before several of the members reported. The consensus of the meeting, though, was that Russia needed a strong monarch, and Catherine said, yeah, I'm that monarch. Catherine carried out some limited reforms of her own. In 1785, Catherine created the Charter of the Nobility, which was kind of like the table of ranks that Peter the Great had done, you know, a uh, table of ranks, if you call, which based a person's rank in Russian society on the amount of service they did to for the crown. Well, Catherine, she called it the Charter of the Nobility, which is basically the same thing. Uh, however, Catherine had learned she had no choice but to appease the nobility because they had the power to remove her from power. The Russian treasury at the time could not afford an army that was strictly loyal to the Russian czar. Catherine also continued to certain economic reforms. She attempted to discontinue barriers to Russian trade. Uh, in, uh, she uh, exported grain, flax, furs, naval stores grew dramatically. Uh, under Catherine, the Russians laid uh, laid a claim to Alaska. Yes. Um, she tried to keep a good relationship with the philosophers so that she would have a good re re reputation for herself throughout Europe and for Russia. Under Catherine, Russia continued to expand, particularly at the expense of the Ottoman Empire and a drive for warm water ports. Catherine was able to do what Peter the Great could not, and that was to seize territory on the Black Sea. Interesting. Yes. Uh, the Ottomans declared war on Russia in 1769, and Russia responded swiftly, and the Russian fleet was able to sail all the way from the Baltic Sea into the eastern Mediterranean. The Treaty of Kunchuk, Kanyari, gave Russia a direct outlet to the Black Sea, free navigation of the Black Sea through the Bosporus. Crimea became an independent state, but Russia annexed it in 1783. The Russians also participated in the tripartitioning of Poland in 1793. What you need to remember is that Poland, which was the second country to adopt a constitution, the U.S. was the first, Poland was the second. Of course, the U.S. didn't have to worry about Austria, Prussia, and Russia on their doorstep like the Poles did. And the Polish government was ineffective, uh, disorganized, and, you know, couldn't make decisions. But anyway, the point of the matter, what you need to remember is that in 1793, Russia, Prussia, and Austria all agreed to take a slice of Poland, and Poland will disappear from 1793 until 1918. Okay, uh, Russia's military successes made other countries in Eastern Europe nervous. Austria did not like Russia's expansion into Eastern Europe, where they themselves had ambitions, and the Ottoman Empire had actually petitioned the Prussians for aid against Russia. Russia, Prussia, and Austria all agreed to divide Poland amongst them. 
Poland had become weakened because it tried to develop a liberal constitutional democracy at the expense of the strength of its nation. The partitioning proved that any nation that had not a strong monarchy, bureaucracy, and army could not compete. And Poland didn't have strong monarchy, strong bureaucracy, and a strong army. And so Poland was absorbed. The powers contended uh, that they were saving Europe and themselves from warfare by building buffer zones out of a weakened Poland. Poland's political weakness left it vulnerable to aggression. Okay. During the last two decades of the 18th century, from 1780 to 1800, this is when the French Rebellion comes about. The French Revolution comes about. Remember, 1789? During the last two decades of the 18th century, the enlightened monarchs became more conservative and more politically repressive. Frederick the Great aged, and with him, the chance of reform in Prussia. Joseph II of Austria's reform provided revolts, provoked revolts, and he himself had to turn to censorship. And in Russia, there was this thing called the Pugachev Rebellion. Uh, the Pugachev Rebellion was when this uh, peasant in southern Russia claimed to be the reincarnation of Peter the Third, the murdered husband of Catherine the Great. And he went around preaching and, you know, seizing property. And a lot of the peasants, you know, got behind him. And he created a rebellion that had to be put down. And Catherine the Great needed help to put down the rebellion. And that rebellion scared her. And so she said, you know what, maybe all this liberalism and being nice is for another time. And so she basically closes the book on the Enlightenment. Okay. Um, once the French Revolution broke out in 1789, Catherine censored books on the Enlightenment. By the close of the century, fear and hostility to change ran through Eastern Europe because the French Revolution, of course. Wherever the Enlightened monarchs tried to introduce ideas of liberalism, they were met with resistance, particularly from the nobility, but sometimes from the lower classes who just used openness to demand more freedoms. Yeah. The monarchs pushed for innovations from a desire to increase their own revenue. In France, this push for openness ended up costing the French the revolution and a king his head. All right. Roman... Numeral 24. Make sure you know that Mary Wollstonecraft wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Her daughter Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. You all know that. When Baroque and neoclassicism dominated the art and architecture of the Age of Reason, a new style came forth in the 1730s. Uh, the style was called Rococo. Uh, Rococo is... Uh, actually a, a reference to a shell, uh, a certain type of seashell, uh, came to reject uh, the Rococo, came to reject the strict adherence to geometric lines. Rococo, Rococo tended to like gentle curves of natural objects like flowers and seashells. Rococo could also be combined with the Baroque styles to create the truly lavish homes building offices of this era. Jacques Louis David uh, created the uh, um, Oath of the Rati, which is a neoclassical type painting. He also did the Death of Marat, though that's a uh, that is a romantic painting. Okay, today what we call classical music was born in the 17th and 18th century. Go over this real fast. The Italian musicians began the genre, but were soon overtaken by the Germans and yes, Austrians. Johann Sebastian Bach wanted to create very well-ordered structured music in his Toccata and Fugue. Uh, Handel wrote Handel's Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Kind of easy to remember. Later came Franz Joseph Haydn. His creations and the seasons were dedicated to common people. And then, of course, was your hero and mine, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Mozart was a prodigy. I mean, you know, 
imagine if Michael Jordan, I've been watching that thing, uh, The Last Dance. It's actually very interesting. But imagine if Michael Jordan and LeBron James had a love child only in, in music. That's not a good example. But imagine that kind of skill or that kind of talent. Uh, and yes, both of those uh, people worked, those individuals worked so very hard for it, but they also had a level of athletic skill, a great level. Uh, but anyway, but Mozart, Mozart was like an alien. I mean, he, his brain understood music. I could talk about him for quite a while and I, we don't have time today, but yeah, Mozart. Mozart was a, what you call a prodigy. Uh, he just got music, meaning that uh, played his first harpsichord concert at six, played his first opera. At, he wrote his, he composed an opera at the age of 12. His greatest works, Anaconda Knock Music, The Marriage of Figaro, which was a comedy that got him in trouble, Don Giovanni, The Magic Flute. Uh, yeah. And Mozart also liked to drink, liked to chase women, and uh, lived life to great excess. And that is why Mozart died penniless at age 35. And if you go to Austria, uh, to uh, Vienna, Austria, where he died, he was born in Salzburg, but he moved to Vienna. Uh, if you go to Vienna to find his graves, you won't find it because... Mozart was so poor, he died of an accumulation of venereal STDs, as well as overindulging in alcohol, as well as opium. He was so poor that he couldn't afford a grade, and so they put him into a pauper's grave. Pauper's grave. Now basically a giant hole in the ground where when poor people died, they just threw them into the ground when enough of them got in there. They buried the giant hole and then dug another. All right. Roman 27. A new literary form was invented during this age, the novel. While today, you know, probably all of you have had to read novels. It's very common. There were no popular novels prior to the age of reason. The market for the novel grew out of several trends. Number one, the plethora. Don't you love that word? Plethora. Uh, of printed materials. To a larger reading public. I mean, more people could read. And more people had money and time. Romantic stories left over from the medieval era to the 16th century. And also the interest of females in the genre and a female reading public. Uh, the first big novels were often written as journal entries or a series of letters. I think I've read this before. I've done this before. Well, the first real popular uh, novel was one called Pamela Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson, which concerned this woman, a young woman, a young girl, who uh, was employed, uh, she was a young poor girl, she was employed in the English countryside by a, um, a Downton Abbey type family, a wealthy landed aristoc aristocratic family who had a whole tribe of servants. And then of course they had a whole big family and it's very interesting. I don't know if you've ever watched Downton Abbey. I watched one episode, not really interested. But the lifestyle was interesting because in the English countryside of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, uh, these people, rich people, they lived in these houses. And the houses were actually two worlds above ground. Uh, and in the big rooms, you had, of course, the ownership family uh, who lived there. And... The second world was the servants who lived and worked in the basement and the kitchen. Of course, they cleaned the house. And sometimes they lived in the upper lofts, you see. Uh, but the house was designed so that the uh, ownership family would have as little contact with the servants as possible. And that was expected. Well, anyway, uh, Pamela was a young girl who worked for such a family, and she was attractive. And most of the book talks about how she has to spend all of her time and wit and, you know, wherewithal, avoiding the romantic and not really romantic, nothing romantic at all. They wanted sex advances of not only 
members of the ownership family, but also other losers in the, uh, the working staff. And that's the whole theme of the book. She, her, she would dodge that. Um, another, Henry Fielding wrote his classic Tom Jones, uh, which was all it was about was this guy named Tom Jones, who simply hopped from one bedroom to another in uh, England of the 18th and 19th centuries. You know, if you thought porn or softcore porn was something new, don't. Ballet was invented by the Italians, then perfected by the French. Louis XIV uh, even participated. Roman numeral 29, free to the dependence on the effects of divine intervention in history. Uh, histories became much more secular. So in other words, uh, during the Enlightenment, the histories they produced tried to stay away from the influence of histories of the past. Histories of the past in Europe uh, had focused on the role of the role of uh, God, the role of religion. You know, this person won a victory because God was with him, the book would say. Well, history of the Enlightenment got away from all that. Voltaire wrote, the age of Louis XIV, the most memorable masterpiece, speaking historically of the era, was the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Sir Edward Gibbon, a 2,000-page sleeping pill. I know because I read it. All right. Roman XIII. There was a split during this time, 18th century, between what is referred to as high culture and pop culture, kind of like today. High culture is referred to the culture of the elite, theologians, scientists, philosoph philosoph philosophers, intellectuals. There was a tremendous explosion in the amount of printed reading materials as well as a reading, republic, a reading public. Books that were explain, uh, expanded both in Britain and France, but there were also a taste for periodicals, magazines, and newspapers. Magazines and newspapers began to open not only in the bigger cities, but even the small towns during the Enlightenment. These were cheaply printed and a simple source of knowledge. Town libraries sprang up where people could rent books. Yeah, back in those days, you didn't borrow a book for free because the books were too valuable. You had to rent the book. Um, yeah, this later lends to the popular tendency to believe all that we see in print. How do I know it? that? Because it says so right there in black and white. That's a joke. But no, it's, it's quite true. I mean, yeah, one of the things that human beings have a tendency to do, if you see it printed, um, you tend to believe it. And unfortunately, you also tend to do that with stupid internet as well. Popular culture appealed to the masses. These, This was the written and unwritten tales of the masses, the bar songs, the body tales, et cetera, et cetera. Just like stupid stuff that goes viral. I hate that term. On the internet. All right, Roman numeral 31. While the university system was a creation of the medieval era, the age of reason put its own stamp on universities and higher education. The school system in Europe perpetuated the class system in Europe rather than providing a way out of poverty. You're going, what? The school system in Europe kept the rich rich and the poor poor. There. Yeah, I feel like that. And so, wait a minute, Mr. Warden. It, didn't you always say education is the way out of poverty? Yes, here and now. But in Europe at the time, no. You see, because even though by the end of the 19th century, just about all European countries will mandate. Um, primary education. Secondary education normally costs money. And as it says there, only the privilege could afford secondary education. They could only, they could only, you know, during this time, during the Industrial Revolution, we're talking about 18th century, 19th century, if you were uh, not rich, chances are you weren't going to get that education. And then that meant that only the privileged could then go to universities. 
Roman numeral three there, it says this will work so well the American South will institutionalize it with the earliest forms of state-sponsored universities. That's Johnny preaching. That's me preaching. Although it's true. It's unrelated. But the fact, getting back to the fact of the matter, that the system they had of the 18th century of the Enlightenment, only the rich could afford. I mean, the educational system basically kept the rich rich and the poor poor. Secondary schools of this era still focused on exclusively on learning Greek and Latin with little or no mathematics. The most common complaint about 18th century higher education was that it was tied to the classical age and not to modern research. Therefore, it was easy to see why very little new scientific discoveries were founded in the universities. Yeah, even during the Enlightenment, the universities were not a source of research. That will change. In the 19th and 20th centuries, though, research and discovery will become part and parcel of the mission of the university system. Ah, yes, crime and punishment. Crime punishments of this era remain tied to the medieval mythology and ideology, which made it seem almost barbaric. There were two levels of punishment. Nobles, for example, were simply beheaded. Commoners, on the other hand, were tortured, broken on the rack, drawn and quartered, and it was done out in public where everybody could see it. The idea being, well, if you see this person being punished, you're not going to do it yourself. By 18, the year 1800, by the way, over 200 crimes in England still warranted a death penalty, and these included pickpocketed, pickpocketing, minor theft. Commoners were also condemned to hard labor or sent to forced labor uh, to uh, Georgia at first in America or after the revolution to Australia. A person could also be sent to debtor's prisons. There's my, you got my quote there, my quote from uh, Christmas Carol. Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Cesar Beccaria wrote on crimes and punishments, which said that punishments should exist as deterrents, not as cruelty for their own sake. John Howard wrote on the state of prisons of England and Wales, which is exactly what the book was about, what prisons were like in England and Wales to expose the cruelties. Roman numeral 33. Medicine in the 18th century was a hit or miss proposition. Uh, I mean, because you're still about, remember, this is the century that, uh, the 18th century was the century George Washington got bled to death. So, you know, uh, still a hit or miss proposition. There was very little real knowledge on how to treat various ailments or wounds. Uh, they did know that if a wound, you know, a, any kind of wound could get infected, and the person, if they recovered from the infection, that was great. But if not, the infection could overtake their entire body, sepsis, and death. So there was a hierarchy of medical experts of the 18th century. Physicians were few and licensed through not only formal college instruction in Latin and Greek, but also from the Royal College of Physicians. Surgeons or something else, were of the barber class and still practice bleeding out the bad humors. Good luck, George Washington. And by the way, also Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great was also bled after she had a stroke. Then there were the apothecaries. Uh, apothecaries are what we, today we call pharmacists, midwives, and faith healers. Hospitals during this time were nest of infestation and filth. Anyway, Roman number 24. Popular culture could be found in many facets of European culture of the age. Uh, feast days were hugely prepared for and anticipated. Carnivals, such as Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday, the day before Lent. Uh, Mardi Gras were celebrations that came before the Lenten season. There were uh, body songs with double entendre meanings, such as when we study Louis the Sixteenth, the key maker could not find the key or whatever. Uh, the commoners of this age did some serious drinking of alcohol. 
Gin and was the drink of the poor in England. Vodka in Russia, straight up. Straight. They didn't, you know, put it in orange juice or anything like that. It was straight up. Uh, the idea was to hammer it down and to get hammered. The old saying was, dead drunk for a penny, that's English, gin, and dead for two, meaning that, you know, uh, a couple, two, two pennies worth of gin would be enough to give you alcohol poisoning. In England, the consumption of gin went from two to five million gallons of gin from 1714 to 1733. The rich drank also. They just drank the more extensive, expensive stuff, beer, port wine, you know, et cetera, more expensive. Uh, the spread of popular culture was accomplished by songs, cheap printed materials, what they call chapbooks, <clears throat> and pamphlets written on cheap paper that had songs, verses, spiritual material, etc. Literacy, while increasing, was still a man's dominion. Female literacy rates lagged far behind in every country, obviously. In most of Catholic Europe, literacy grew slowly. Only in the Austrian Empire, thank you, Joseph II, was there an effort to educate at the state expense. Since Protestants were more concerned with every man was his own priest, the rates of literacy and education of children got more attention. Yes, I'm trying to finish this. Uh, churches, by this time, were institutionalized, but also coming under attack from the intellectuals of the day. We've talked about this before. Yeah, uh, you know, churches obviously had to fend off the attacks of the Enlightenment. Churches, however, did perform the very valuable services of keeping records, birth, marriage, death records, which other institutions were not doing. Some churches also offered schools, but those are mainly for the wealthy. 2038, sorry. The relationship between church and state varied across Europe. In some states, the Catholic Church still held an enormous amount of influence such as uh, in Poland, such as uh, in Austria. Um, in the Protestant German world, the state actually dictated practice to the local churches. In Spain and France, the Catholic Church still remained powerful. The Jesuits in these and other states became so influential that they actually were expelled in some areas. In Portugal, Jesuits, not Jesuits, uh, were expelled and their property was seized. There were cries for religious tolerance. In France, the last burning of a heretic occurred in 1781. Now, when you think about it, that's pretty late. The last burning of a heretic. Anyway, Joseph II of Austria, the most enlightened of all the despots, enacted his toleration patent of 1781, which allowed religious tolerations to the private practice of Protestantism and the Eastern Orthodox Church. He also adopted a liberal policy towards Jews, but that policy was short-lived. It died when he died, as did his other acts of tolerations. <coughs> did you get, I'm sorry if I coughed on you. Jews, of course, lived outside the realm of Christian Europe and were widely despised. You know what a pogrom is. Once again, it is a, it's a Russian term uh, for a government-organized and supported killing of Jews. The largest group of Jews were the Asikonic Jews and lived primarily in Eastern Europe, which is where most Jews in Europe live. In poverty, another group were called the Sephardic Jews and had been expelled from Spain during the Inquisition. They migrated to Amsterdam, London, Venice, and Frankfurt. There they practiced banking and commercial ventures when they could get into that. Although, once again, most Jews lived in poverty. Most Jews in Europe all the way through World War II lived in abject poverty. Uh, court Jews are Jews who had one influence in the court of courts of royalty because probably they loaned somebody money. Religiosity in the rest of Europe during this age also came under attack. Catholic attendance at mass began to waver. 
Protestants continued to debate the Catholics, and Protestants debated each other over practices, and Protestants kept splintering uh, into other groups. In England, you have your Baptist movements and your Methodist movements. Uh, the new In England, the new Anglican faith seemed as impious to many uh, who sought more conservative faiths, such as Puritanism, Baptist, and Quakers. John Wesley founded the Methodist Church. Wesley's church appealed to the desire for piety amongst many in England. The church became strong, especially in the New World. And that finishes that chapter. And I'm sorry I took 55 minutes. I'm sorry I rushed through it. Uh, I will send you the next unit, but I can tell you right now, if you already have it, uh, the next unit will be talking about life, uh, life in the ancient regime, life in Europe prior to the French Revolution. Okay? And like I said, I'm sorry today it took so long, but, you know, it's crunch time, guys. It's crunch time. We've got to go. Um, so thank you for your attendance. Uh, read all the documentation, and if you don't, didn't get something from College Board yesterday, find out why, okay? All right, goodbye now. I'm going to go and see you tomorrow.